Welcome from the First Presbyterian Church in Burbank. We're glad you're here. Let's join the service now and hear the proclaiming of God's Word. And as they're going, please turn with me to Acts, the 15th chapter. We're looking at the end of that chapter, verses 36 through 41 today. And then, of course, next week we'll look at chapter 16 if you'd like to read ahead. As we've been going through the book of Acts, we've seen the, the work of the early church and how the gospel was spread. The story of the book of Acts is a story of the church obeying what Christ said. You know, he said the gospel will be preached in Jerusalem, and Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth. And uh, now we see uh, the missionaries going out to the uttermost parts of the earth. And we have been noticing that Paul and Barnabas have been journeying together. Well, that's going to come to an end today. And they're going to have a disagreement. So we're going to look at their disagreement or their sharp dispute, if we can. Acts 16, verse 36 to 41. Listen to the word of the Lord. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. But Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had, desired for, because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord. He went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's a very short text this morning, but within it there's a lot to talk about because we see Paul and Barnabas parting ways and... um, There's a sharp dispute between them. An old story is told about two men who were neighbors in an ancient village. These neighbors couldn't get along. They had a dispute. A matter arose between them, and they couldn't solve it by themselves, and they were becoming very hostile toward one another. So they went to the village rabbi. They said, Rabbi, can you help us determine who's right and who's wrong? The rabbi said, sure, I'll give it a shot. And so as they sat before the rabbi, the first man got up to plead his case, and he gave his side of the story. And after he was done, the rabbi said, you are right. The second man jumped up and said, hey, wait a minute. I haven't given my side of the story yet. The rabbi said, all right, you're right about that. Go ahead. So the second man began telling his side of the story, the matter that was in dispute between them. And when he was done, the rabbi said, you are right. The first man jumped up and said, wait a minute, you told me I was right, how can we both be right? And the rabbi sat down for a moment and pondered and he said, you are right. And that was the end of the dispute. They didn't know where to go from there. I like that ancient story because they didn't get a resolution to their conflict. And that, my friends, tells us what life is about. In the complexity of life, there are times when we don't get the answers that we're looking for. We don't get the end to the dispute. In fact, we don't even know who's right and who's wrong sometimes. Sometimes the rightness and wrongness seems so easy to us. I'm right, you're wrong. Everybody's mad not to see that. Have you ever felt that way? I remember growing up and my older sister Dorothy, she was wrong all the time. And then I grew up, uh, I was right 100% of the time, but then the trouble is I've grown up and now realize that she may have been right once or twice. Now, if my sister Dorothy happens to come to church, you are not to tell her that I admitted that at all. But the complexity of life is such that sometimes we don't know who's right and who's wrong. In our passage this morning, Paul and Barnabas were locking horns in a sharp dispute. No matter how many times I've read the passage, I see both of their points. In fact, they're both right. The issue at hand was John Mark. He was Barnabas' cousin. We see that in Colossians chapter 4, verse 10, that, that this is Barnabas' cousin, John Mark. John is also known as Mark, John Mark. He joined Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary trip. A few weeks ago, we talked about Paul and Barnabas being sent out. And it's quite uh, certain that John Mark was part of the company that went with them. And it was a good trip at the beginning. They started off with power. Their healings and miracles took place. John Mark was there when Paul and Barnabas stood against Elymas the sorcerer. Remember that story a few weeks ago? 
He saw, John Mark saw the power of God unleashed upon the deceptive man and how he was blinded when Paul told him that he would be blind. But shortly into the trip, John Mark left. We see in Acts chapter 13, 13, these words, Now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga and Pamphylia, and John left them and returned to Jerusalem. Now the author of the book of Acts, Luke himself, is being unemotional about this. But we get clues within the text that this John Mark was frustrated. He he began to discover that it wasn't easy doing the Christian walk, and it was certainly not easy going out into the world to preach the gospel. It was uncomfortable. It was unfamiliar to John Mark. He was from Jerusalem. He was Jewish. And now he's traveling with Paul and Barnabas to the Greek and Roman world and seeing pagan sites. And that must have been very difficult for him. And then the hardships continued. So when we see the, the persecution they suffered, they had to sleep wherever they could find a place to sleep. The adversity was too much for John Mark, and as a young man, not quite firm in his dedication of faith that it would take to be a missionary in the world, he left. He went home. We read about John Mark's beginnings in the faith. You might remember that he was the son of a woman named Mary, and the early church in Jerusalem used to meet at Mary's house, and John Mark was there. We find a story in Acts 12 where Peter is miraculously let out of prison by an angel in Jerusalem that, they, that, that he goes to uh, Mary's home and John Mark is there. That's where the early church gathered. So John Mark from the beginning had great influence of being in the very first church. We find that John Mark is an early disciple. He's a young man and in the Gospel of Mark there's a story. This is written by John Mark. And in the Gospel of John Mark we find this story of a young man who's there when Jesus is arrested in the garden and he runs away and has to run away without his clothing as they try to take it from him. He runs away naked. And most people, most scholars believe that's John Mark himself written in the gospel that he writes. John Mark was a believer before Paul was a believer. But Paul's faith was passionate for Jesus. And John Mark, on the other hand, was passionate, but it hadn't been well developed yet. And so in our story today, I don't know how the conversation went. I can see John Mark coming to his older cousin, Barnabas, and saying, "Um, Barnabas, I made a mistake. Remember when I was in the mission field with you and and Paul and others, and it didn't work out, and I went home? I've matured now. I really would like to go back to the mission field. Can I get another shot? I can imagine Barnabas called, that's his nickname, son of encouragement. I can imagine him seeing John Mark and saying, well, you know what? This is wonderful because I know that the gospel is a gospel of second chances. Sure, come along with us. We're going to go on this new missionary trip and I'm sure Paul will be in agreement that we should take you along. If anyone knows about second chances, Paul certainly does. I can also imagine that excitement as Barnabas came to Paul. Hey, Paul, guess what? You're not going to believe this. John Mark, who was with us, he's coming again. I don't think that Barnabas expected the reaction that Paul gave to him. He probably jumped back and said, really? I don't think so. Paul was passionate about preaching Jesus, and he was always on the go. Paul had to keep traveling from city to city, and that was his gift He didn't have time for unnecessary burdens and weights. He didn't appreciate people who set their minds to the plow and midway through their work just kind of said, ah, it's too hard, I'm going to go on my own way without finishing the work of planting the seeds. I can imagine Paul being very frustrated and abruptly saying to Barnabas, no, absolutely not. We don't have time for this. John Mark had his chance I'm gr- Listen, Barnabas, I'm grateful that he matured. I'm happy to hear about his renewed faith and his conviction, but he can't go with us. He, he can do great work for the Lord on his own, but if he comes with us, we're going to face imprisonment again, death perhaps, beatings, stonings, who knows? We cannot have him turn back again. And when I look at that dispute, I realize that both Paul and Barnabas we're right. You see, on the one hand, God is the God of second chances. 
John Mark should be given in a second opportunity. On the other hand, there could be no half-mindedness or else the work would be in jeopardy. Paul and Barnabas were both right. You ever been in a dispute where both parties are right? Where do you go from there? That's life. That's the complexity of life. I want you to note that at this time that Paul and Barnabas began sparring with one another, they had been really good friends for more than 15 years. There's something about the friendship that they weren't just friends and acquaintances. They had lived together. They had slept on the ground. They had been beaten together. They had been put in jail. They had suffered all sorts of things. In fact, I would dare say there were probably no two closer people on the face of the earth than Paul and Barnabas at this point. Why did this have to happen? You ever ask that question? Why does this have to happen? Why now? As we look back, we see that they were being moved by the Holy Spirit to move in different directions. And that was good. If this frustrating moment, this new change could be handled correctly, they could double the missionary efforts and reach the world more powerfully than just being together. It was time for them to move in different directions. But Barnabas and Paul were caught up in that argument in the situations of their own lives. I've come to learn, and maybe you have as well, I'm sure you have, that frustrating times in our life is exactly when the Holy Spirit's doing something new. And the problem is with the frustration is when we don't do right with that frustration. Imagine if we just sat and waited upon the Lord. God, I'm frustrated. You must be doing something in my life. I'm going to wait to see what it is. The problem for Paul and Barnabas is that while they were both right, they were both wrong. They didn't handle it right. Well, how do we know that? Look at verse 39 again. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord. The phrase, they had such a sharp disagreement, meant that they were being contentious. In fact, in the original language, the word means they were irritated with each other. Their tempers flared and they wrote each other off. I can hear Barnabas shouting, Fine then, Paul, go your way. I'm taking my cousin with me. I can hear Paul shouting back, Good, it's settled, get on your way. The two departed. If we look at Paul, we immediately say, Paul, what are you doing? Had you forgotten what Barnabas had done for you? You were the one out there killing the believers. You were the one who nobody trusted. And and when you had a conversion to Christ and became a believer, there was only one person who stood up for you, Barnabas. And he stood before the others, the apostles and the elders, and he said, no, no, we have to trust this man. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is a gospel of second chances. Paul had been vouched for by Barnabas. And Barnabas alone courageously defended Paul. And now Paul couldn't give Mark, John Mark, a second chance? Wasn't this just as important as going on a trip to tell others about the God who gives second chances? God's heart must have been broken as Barnabas and Paul sparred with each other. I'm convinced that One of the most devastating sins for us as believers to one another is this. We write each other off so quickly. And we often feel justified in doing so. Why? Because I'm 100% right. And you're 100% wrong. And God's heart must just break because in the history of the world, there has only been one who has ever been 100% right. His name is Jesus. Do you give people second chances? Oh, I think of Jesus and knowing that his best friend and closest disciple to him, Judas, betrayed him. 30 pieces of silver, which was not a lot of money, wouldn't have secured Judas's lifestyle, but 
When I read the very gut-wrenching moment in the Garden of Gethsemane and I see how Judas treated Jesus, I want to punish Judas and send him to hell. How could you do that to the Messiah? And yet Jesus, at the very moment of betrayal, turned to Judas and an angry mob behind him and said, friend, why have you come? Now Jesus knew why he had come, but it was Jesus extending one more invitation why have you come, friend? As if in that moment, if Judas had said, I, I don't know, it would have changed the course of history. But that's Jesus. He extends again and again, even to a Judas, a second chance. Jesus is the one who gives us all second chances. The most marvelous thing about Jesus is that he treats us not as we are right now. I thank God for that. He treats us now for the person we're going to be. I know that I sin. I know that I fail in my life for living for God. I'm trying, but I'm not perfect. Sometimes I believe that God is going to judge me, God is going to do something judgmentally to me because certainly I deserve that. And in response to my failures, listen to this. God treats us not for who we are now in our situations, but he treats us now for whom we're going to be right now. God knows who you really are and who you were meant to be. And God pours out his grace upon our lives. And if we're open, we receive that mercy, forgiveness, redemption, and grace. You remember the story of the prodigal son? The prodigal son who, when you read the story, was the son was a jerk. Let's just be honest. The son came to his dad one day and he said, Dad, I wish you were dead. That's the translation. When a son asks his dad for the inheritance, you only get the inheritance when the dad dies. I wish you were dead. Give me my money. And we know the story. He went on his way, did terrible things, ended up in a pigsty. And then one day he came home. And when he came home, what he found was the father every day had been watching and waiting for him to return. And when he came home, when the son came home, the father ran to him, embraced him, and wrapped his arms around his son's pigsty clothing and stench. He kissed his cheek. That's the way God does for us when we turn and come home again. And if that acceptance was not enough, Jesus tells us there's more to the story. The father puts shoes on his feet, and he gives them the ring of authority right there at that moment if I had been his father I would have said okay you can earn this back but the father didn't treat his son the way he deserved the father treated his son because he loved him and he knew that he, he belonged to him and he knew that he could be something very powerful that's how God treats us God will treat you right now for the way you are yet to be. That's love. That's grace. That's what it means to be a part of God's kingdom. How could Paul forget that story? But before it seems like I'm taking Barnabas' side, let's take a look at Barnabas. I have to mention that though he sought grace for John Mark, he also walked away from reconciliation with his friend. Barnabas determined, he, he was determined, he, he, he knew that he knew the will of God. Well, perhaps he did, but he left angry with Paul. He wrote him off. If you read on in the text, as we did read, you find out that no mention is made of Barnabas and John Mark after he departs. Did Barnabas receive the rest of the believers behind? Did, did he leave the rest of the believers behind? Or did he just leave too quickly? You see, at the end of our passage, what we find is this. The believers who were there, Barnabas and, and his cousin left, Paul and Silas were there, that we read that the believers blessed Paul and Silas to go on their journey. What happened to Barnabas and Mark? They didn't stick around for the blessing of the believers. And that's the gospel too. It is so important that we know that we need the fellowship of believers in our lives and the blessings from one another. Every Sunday we come together. I hope we bless one another. I hope we say, hey, it's going to be a rough week. God bless you. I'm going with you in spirit. 
Somehow Barnabas and John Mark not mentioned for that blessing. Where do you struggle with your relationships? I hope you haven't written any off. God doesn't do that. When was the last time your temper flared at another person? When did you last say about someone else, how dare they? I think it hurt the ministry for Paul and Barnabas. The Spirit was moving them on to do ministry by themselves. What a blessing it would have been had they been blessed to do that. Instead, there was division. And over the years, I think if Paul and Barnabas were here this morning, they'd probably urge us, that hurt us. Those years apart hurt us. But we find something beautiful in the passage in the New Testament. We find in 1 Corinthians 9, 6 that many years later, Paul actually says, Barnabas is my good friend who served so diligently with me. Later, Paul found that John Mark, he says this in 2 Timothy to Timothy. He says that John Mark was a great help to him in his life. He wrote to Timothy, get Mark, bring him with you. He's so helpful to me in my ministry. Because many years later, they both saw the evidence of how could God would still bless them even though they would divide from each other. I don't know if it was Paul's rebuke or Barnabas' mercy that shaped John Mark. John Mark may have been out there and thinking, oh boy, <laughs> Paul's not happy with me. I'm going with my cousin Barnabas, but maybe I should, maybe I should show him, prove to him that I can do this work in the ministry, and he did. I don't know if it was Barnabas' mercy that shaped him, I'm sure it was. Perhaps it was both of those influences. But in the end, God reconciled them. And I think Paul and Barnabas would probably say to us this morning, friends, even us, none of us are 100% right. Jesus is. We can follow him. It's important to remember that to Jesus, the arguments, and he said this very clearly in his ministry, the arguments, the debates, the dissensions that we have with each other are never to get in the way of our friendships. We will disagree, and that's okay. But how we disagree with one another, listen to this, how we disagree to one, with one another will open the way for the gospel to be spread or hurt the gospel from being spread. It's how we deal with it. How do we treat one another? Do we treat with one another with, with respect? Can we honor one another that maybe the other person has a point? In the 19th century, there was a way for dealing with disagreements. I can honestly say I don't know if anyone's ever used it, and today we certainly don't use the process because all we do is talk at each other. The moment someone opens their mouth, we're figuring out how to prove them wrong instead of listening. In the 19th century, there was a, the, the, role, the, the process was this. Number one, listen to your opponent. Listen to the other person. Try to figure out what they're saying and what their point is. Number two, once a person listens, they have to repeat back the point the opponent is making and find something they appreciate about it. Do you even imagine doing that? And once you know the opponent's point and appreciate something about it, then you have right. Then and only then do you have a right to present your point and the other person has to do the same thing that you did to them. Can you imagine having that process? We might hear each other again. In the end, we need to listen to one another. Imagine if Paul and Barnabas came together and said, look, I'm very upset. I'm upset with you. We can't take John Mark and the other saying, we have to take John Mark. It's the central of the gospel. Imagine if they said, okay, wait a minute, wait a minute, calm down. I see your point. I see your point. I disagree with your point. Perhaps it could have been that even Paul and Barnabas would have said to one another, we just couldn't do ministry together, but you know what, brother? I'm going to pray for you, and I'm going to bless you, and I'll pray for God to use you mightily. We may never figure out what's the right course of action to take, but we're not going to let our disagreement get in the way of blessing each other. 
Jesus left us with a strict command and we are not to forget this because it is the it is the it is, it is the entire gospel. He said in Matthew 5, if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there at the altar. Go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. Relationships are more important to Jesus than our sense of always having to be right. And notice that Jesus didn't say... If you have something against your brother, he said, but rather, if your brother has something against you. In other words, if there is a brokenness, a division in the relationship, Jesus would say, do everything you can to make it right. I know people today that are still angry at each other from 20 years ago, and they don't know what they argued about, but they know they're right. And they want an apology. And that's sad. Because, friends, we're not going to remember in eternity the things we disagreed about. We're only going to remember the things that we did for Jesus. And we've got work to do in showing the world what love looks like. We can disagree with one another. But at the end of the day, we will not let those disagreements change our radical love for people. Amen? Let's pray. God, as we come to the next song, it is well with my soul. I pray that it would be well with our souls. That as we sing this song, that you might open our hearts to maybe be honest and say that we always think we're 100% right, and maybe we're not. We'd be quick to extend forgiveness to others and always want reconciliation because only then, as we've been reconciled to you and now with other people, will we experience the peace the deep peace that you want to bless our lives with. So I pray today that we'd be encouraged to do a little reflection to find out who that Barnabas or Paul might be and say to them, look, I I don't want anything to get in the way. We can disagree, but I love you. Let's move forward. Oh, Holy Spirit, search our hearts and bless us that we might be a fragrance, a beautiful fragrance, a blessing to you and to this world in Jesus' name. Amen. We hope this service has been a blessing to you. We also invite you to join us to worship in person on Sunday mornings. We have services at 9.15 and 11.15. Thank you for watching, and may God bless you.